Hello, this is Shrunken Shrine, and the first of something I'm going to call Shrine Offerings. Have some tea, take a cookie, water the plant if you would. This is a series of little vignettes on art that I find thought-provoking. Some of them are just bottled up thoughts about media that have been stewing in my drafts for ages that I need to get out of my system in one way or another before I do something drastic. Others are little creative things I came up with myself. Now, these all carry a chance of descending into nebula's drivel, so fair warning to you there, in advance. I'm no expert on anything I'm about to go into, just a passing enthusiast. Some of these segments have been afforded the dignity of segues into one another, in an effort to trick you into thinking there's some sort of overarching theme. Others haven't been quite so lucky, and are really just tenuously connected items of fleeting curiosity that I would like to talk about, but hopefully they may also be of curiosity to you too. The connective tissue for this first video is this question. How have you come across the media that matters to you? Have they been recommendations from friends? Influences from family? Or suggestions from machines? Somehow, right now, you're watching this. Thank you, by the way. But how did that happen? What better way to start a YouTube channel than to piss in the punch bowl of the modern content factory culture that it was instrumental in bringing about? Needless to say, YouTube's meteoric rise has brought with it big shifts in the online media landscape. One of those that has stuck with me over the last few years is the term pivot to video. Pivot to video originally referred to the mid-2010s phenomenon of news outlets, desperate to mitigate years of gradual decline, cutting their staff writers and their budgets to give video content production higher priority. In April 2016, YouTube overtook Facebook and became the second most visited website in the world after Google itself and that's still the case today in 2023. Websites, and not just YouTube, were becoming better able to host short-form video without it being so overcompressed that it felt like watching a VHS tape through the side of a shot glass. Video content was the way of the future, the burgeoning social networks told advertisers, who were nothing if not eager for new ways to pursue that ever-elusive youth demographic. Readings, old hat, daddy-o. Haven't you heard of the numbers that these vines are doing now? As far as news media and their advertisers are concerned, that pivot didn't pan out quite as expected. One study by the Pew Research Center in October 2016 found only about 4 out of 10 Americans, aged between 18 to 49, preferred to watch their news, with the remainder preferring to read or listen to it. Around the same time, in September of 2016, Facebook found itself in some fairly toasty water when it came out that they'd made, how should I put it, mistakes with their video metric tracking. According to the Wall Street Journal, one such metric, the average duration of video viewed, did not take into account views of under three seconds, such as people just scrolling past an auto-playing video on their feed without really watching it, thereby boosting the figures. This error in figure tracking went on for two years. Even after this came out, Facebook wasn't particularly transparent on what data it shared with third parties. So advertisers continued to have to take them at their word that the figures that they were reporting were accurate. As one marketing advertiser put it, this is tantamount to letting Facebook mark their own homework. All of this is to say nothing of the writers and non-video content producers who lost money, jobs, and career opportunities so their employers could pursue tasty-sounding numbers that weren't even all that accurate. That was over five years ago, though, which may as well be ancient history in the time-dilated world of the wide web. News and advertising is one thing, but I think that it was important pretext for a continued greater pivot to video for online media in general. People my age may remember that their internet entertainment diet consisted of more reading blogs and trying to get your animated forum signature to display correctly than it did watching videos until YouTube exploded in popularity and it became a viable career option. 
Social media is still seeing considerable user growth in 2023, but that growth can't be infinite. So now the goal is shifting to keeping the people who are already using your platform from going anywhere else. And you can sense both owners getting desperate and creators getting tired of having to game every element of what they do just to stand a chance of being heard above the cacophony of everyone else. This is a time where Twitter's chairman publicly begs people to post videos for money on his platform that was never built to host them in the first place. Probably something to do with that brittle code stack, I imagine. Instagram, feeling the heat from TikTok blowing up, caught backlash last year by over-prioritizing short-form video. The five most visited websites in the world are floundering in mutual enmity, locked in a mud fight to keep your attention, to show you as little as possible that you aren't already inclined to enjoy, and most importantly, to deliver as many ads in and around the videos as possible. In the interests of not coming across like I pine for a time where your modem would have to sing a little song to itself just to connect to the internet, I don't believe the increased priority video content has been afforded is strictly bad for online entertainment. If the words unregistered Hypercam 2 mean anything to you, then you've witnessed an amazing increase in the production value of the average popular YouTube video in a very short amount of time. I also love to be living in a time where I can find feature-length Broadcast quality documentary is on, I don't know, the speedrunning history of King's Quest VI? How could TV ever compete with that sort of thing on tap? What do you mean, paying their writers? The sad part, really, is that the fight to try to be heard over the crowd has turned gaming YouTube's algorithm into something of a gambling machine that almost borders on superstition. Just like Facebook encouraging the pivot to video all those years ago, there is little transparency as to what makes it tick. If you're a niche channel that's just trying to make it worth your time and effort, then more power to you. But without naming names, it is dispiriting to see so many channels forced to turn out overlong videos at a regular pace, just to keep themselves competitive in the ecosystem. Keep the punters coming back. Implement as many chances for ads to be played as you can. Flog them enough magic spoon. And who knows? Maybe one day the algorithm will catapult you and your passion into a full-time job or small business that you might not hate quite as much as whatever else you'd be doing for a living. Broadcast yourself indeed. Now that I'm 62 years old and only 22 years away from retirement, sometimes I get home and just take the path of least resistance for my online entertainment. Give me the usual bartender, you know what I like. And that right there is the lifeblood of the algorithm, consumer passivity. Part of that is simply down to the shifting demands of my life, sure, but I don't think that my willingness to just impulsively decide to consume whatever sounds good at a moment's notice has been entirely up to me. The internet enables this whenever possible, and it's the same with streaming TV. If you've ever found yourself just throwing something on Netflix that you don't really care about, or whatever your walled garden of choice may be, then it's happened to you too. The majority of my internet usage is to treat it as a background noise factory for the commute, a repository of reddit threads for help on descaling my shower heads, and well, that's about it, really. I've had enough! I'm going to try harder to find cool stuff, like I used to when I was a teenager and I had all the time in the world. So, here's the thuddingly obvious wrap-up. The internet post-pivot to video is like any other form of media when it transforms from an emergent art form into an industry. It's happened to literature, movies, music, video games, and now it's simply the internet's turn. But with every passing day, there are more and more people than ever making incredible stuff for any interest you can name, especially if you take a bit of time and look in the nooks and crannies. It's just that we have to dig deeper through the ads, the grifts, the seeming infinity of white noise to find them. So, let's keep trying, shall we? Together. Stop. Find yourself again. Stop. Find yourself again. So, all of that about my frustration with modern internet serves as a nice backdrop to talking about a website that's been around longer than I've ever even had a computer to call my own. 
how much of the endless well of pure online stuff out there comes to you out of genuine self-interest, or has simply been placed before you without even the human touch of recommendation. Mark America's Grammatron asked this before the words algorithm and content carried the connotations they now have. I'm not sure how to categorise Grammatron for the sake of trying to explain what it actually is as a bit of media. We can say with certainty that it's a website, one that was put together between 1993 and 1997, but it's harder to say where on the spectrum it falls between being interactive fiction and an online art installation. Anyway, that's besides the point. Your experience with Grammatron will shake out something like this. If you want to try it yourself first, a link is in the description, but for reasons that will quickly become apparent, it kind of defies being spoiled in the conventional sense. You go to the website, and you click the first link, Interfacing. While waiting for the machine to read you, I suggest you click this green link for an unsettling ambient and spoken word soundtrack to accompany you, which is what you're hearing right now. For the next six minutes, you'll try to keep up with fragments of sentences in this eye-bleeding black-on-red text, which I've actually tried to desaturate here for the sake of all our rods and cones. Several of these messages may actually not be displayed long enough for you to be able to read them, and they're certainly opaque enough in their meaning that you won't have enough time to dwell on them before the page automatically clicks itself through to another hyperlink, thrusting a new message before you. Once this prologue of sorts finishes, you're taken to the website's second, and more substantial part, Abe Golem. This starts off as a web page with eight links, and the message, I'm Abe Golem, an old man. I drove a sign to the end of the road, and then I got lost. Find me. Choose a link. Away you go. What you're watching here is one such example of a read-through of the website. Bound together by over 2,000 hyperlinks, it's safe to say that no two explorations of Grammatron are ever going to be exactly alike. Very little is explicitly explained in Grammatron. Really, you just cumulatively gather a mental profile of certain characters and concepts by recurrently coming across them as you click through links. The basic through line, as I understand it, is that you learn about the life and work of Technomancer programmer and Grammatron creator Abe Golem and his journey through the virtually simulated city of Prague 23, with the intent of reconnecting him with his lover Cynthia. Within its own fiction, Grammatron is a digital writing machine which generates a fully immersive virtual reality for its users. This output is drawn from an almost infinite bank of influences, and these narrative excerpts only make sense in juxtaposition with whatever excerpts you used to get to the current one. In other words, it can only be understood from repeated loops around its links while you try to connect whatever dots you can. However, this is only an artistic simulation of the automatically generated content that's available to us now with ChatGPT, DALI, and their ilk. After all, author Mark America still had to write every word of this himself, all 1100 HTML pages of it. You can manually type URLs and refresh the page as many times as you like, and the contents of the page being pointed to will always be the same. You can copy and paste links to come back to later, or use your browser's back button if you don't like the breadcrumb trail that you're currently on. The more you explore, the less random your journey will likely be, because visited links will turn purple. At other times, it will suddenly play music, display GIFs, or remove your ability to freely explore. In one particular segment, Alphaville, 26 links are rapidly cycled through, with each one sequentially highlighting a letter of the alphabet as a link. You can click these, but all it does is point you through to the next letter slightly faster. You can increase the roller coaster's speed, but you're still just being brought along for the ride. And that, I think, is the theme and appeal of Grammatron a quarter century later, exploring the notions of control and choice in today's online world and what feels like a growing lack of both. The two parts reflect two distinct kinds of frustration I find with the modern internet experience. In the interfacing section, you are simply letting the content wash over you, at best only half paying attention to kill time, or at worst, scrambling to keep up or make sense of the constant stimuli bombardment for fear of missing out on something important or worthwhile. In the Abe Golem section, 
You have all the time in the world to click through this recursive, teleporting labyrinth that lets you choose what you think is most interesting to you, but ultimately just keeps giving you more of the same thing, with little that actually feels really new. And when you run out, well, here it is again, just in a different order. There isn't really even an ending. When you get asked if you want to go to Genesis Rising, you're returned to the interfacing sequence, and it all begins again. It gives you the facsimile of interactivity, without really being interactive at all. Anyway, all this to say, I encourage looking up Grammatron at least once. It's definitely a work that could only exist online. The closest experience you'll probably get with physical media would be in the cut-up style writings of William S. Burroughs, but that's not the same as having the sense of the invisible machine guiding your hand. I suggest firing up the Grammatron and gauging your reaction to it, then comparing it to how you feel when you use the actual internet. Do you get frustrated by the impenetrability of its chopped and screwed narrative, or do you derive some enjoyment in collecting these odd puzzle pieces that will never form a coherent whole? Do you find its simulation of pop-up ads more or less frustrating than being forced to watch actual ads on YouTube videos and news websites? Lastly, does it actually provide you with something worthwhile, despite how demanding it is on your senses? Okay, so, I remember how I came across Grammatron. It was referred to in some bibliography of a paper on cyberpunk literature that I read in uni a long time ago, and its name and citation were so unusual compared to everything else in the list that I just had to look it up and find out more. Now, here's my bit of engagement bait for you. What's a bit of media that means a lot to you that you have no memory of finding for the first time? Postcards to the usual address. While you turn that over in your brain for a bit, let me tell you about mine. What you're currently looking at is Meritus, a PC game released in February 2007 by Lancer X, also known as ASCII. I have no idea how I found this. It's not some indie critical darling or cult hit. Search for it on anything, and at no point since its release has it ever really made any sort of dent in the general gaming consciousness. Its creator seems to have moved on to other projects, although it is still available for free on their website. Despite that, here I am with the executable on at least three devices in this room alone, and even though I have a Steam library with so many games on it unplayed that it forces me to confront my own mortality a little bit whenever I open it, I keep coming back to Meritus every now and then for a quick blast, but not necessarily just for the gameplay. In brief, Meritus is a top-down dungeon crawler with randomly generated room placements. Mechanically, it feels like a bullet hell shooter. Enemies, especially bosses, spit out these hails of damaging orbs and lasers, many homing, most unavoidable. The player, however, doesn't fire back with bullets of their own. By taking the part of PSI user Merit, the spacebar becomes a chargeable and upgradable psychic wave beam attack that can damage enemies and wipe out projectiles before they hit the player. However, this beam has a cooldown period once released, so you need to be careful with your timing. Killing enemies gets you crystals, crystals get you upgrades to your shields and beams. Standard stuff, but it's done very well. In 2023, we're actually somewhat spoiled for games that cross these genres. Enter the Gungeon, The Binding of Isaac, and Hades are but three popular games that have all seen big success in the years since the release of Meritus, each with deeper customization, richer assets, and, honestly, more involving gameplay. Nevertheless, I keep coming back to Meritus. It's addictive, you can probably get it running on a toaster these days, and all you need is a keyboard. Even booting it up purely just to grab footage for this, the hours melted away as I ran from room to room with my favoured tactic of charging up my magic as much as I could, running into a new room, releasing it immediately, then backing out like a coward to lure any survivors out and lie in wait while recharging my attack. Survive long enough to upgrade your shields and beams, and without even realising, you will become the hunter rather than the hunted. The UI keeps track of how many of the thousands and thousands of rooms you've visited and enemies you've blown up, but as long as you come across the three bosses, you can finish it. 
100%ing it would take many hours if you're so inclined. It's the kind of game where, if you find the gameplay loop of explore, kill, upgrade, repeat fun for 30 minutes, you'll probably find it fun for 30 hours. There's also some very nice design touches that take advantage of its visual simplicity. Rooms dynamically change colour depending on the quantity and strength of nearby enemies. The closer the screen is to a shade of blue, the safer you are. If it goes completely red, then you're likely surrounded or you're in a boss fight. These circles around the enemies turn into crosshairs to let you know if you've charged your beam enough to kill it, which avoids wasted blasts and encourages you to dodge bullets until the last possible moment so you can wipe out as many enemies as possible. Meritus has problems, of course. I'm sure for every person who would like it, there's another who would find it too repetitive. It has minor annoyances, such as the cramped rooms making it easy to walk directly into enemies as soon as you enter doors, or the fact that your likelihood of success is quite dependent on whether or not you're lucky enough to start off with a good randomly generated maze layout. So, Meritus is good, but it's since been bettered, so why bring it up? Well, without wanting to sound too morbid, the internet is a bit of a graveyard, and a poorly maintained one at that. I like to keep coming back to Meritus because it reminds me to keep digging it up when I have the chance. You never know what you'll find, or how it'll come to you. We've long passed the point where the web consists of more abandoned material than it does actively curated stuff. Articles about when Facebook will have more deceased users than living ones do the rounds from time to time, which makes me wonder about what percentage of the internet is composed of content uploaded by creators who no longer interact with it, either through choice or inability. As far as I can tell from this single 12-year-old tweet from their long dormant account, Meritus's own creator no longer seems to wish to be bothered about it, so they'll probably never be aware of the impact it continues to make on some non-zero number of people. I mean, it made enough of an impression on me to compel me to bang on about it this much. People make stuff and move on from it all the time, that's nothing new, but it's interesting to think about the life it can still take on for others who may come across it. Let me get personal and a bit pathetic for a moment. I used to have a very minor YouTube presence as a Let's Player in the late noughties. It wasn't a big channel, but the people who found it liked it enough to leave nice comments. I would record commentary as I played the game on Audacity with a 10 quid USB microphone that I bought from Tesco by tucking it down my sweater and angling it toward my chin, then sync it up with the game in Windows Movie Maker in post. And you know what? It was a lo-fi operation for sure, but for 2008 or so, it was far from the worst production value on YouTube at the time, if I may blow my own trumpet. But I can't prove it to you. When I graduated from high school, I got embarrassed about it and deleted my account, and the laptop I kept the footage on has long been landfill. If it's not the nostalgia talking, it's probably the midlife crisis. But I regret losing that stuff. I worked hard on it. I learned a lot. Sometimes you should hold on to these little windows into who you were. Especially if, like me, you don't continue making more of them as you get older. Because eventually life takes over, and you may wish you had a little more to tangibly look back on and say, Hey, so that's what I was doing when I was 16. For better or for worse. To wrap this up and loosely tie this back around to Meritus, Meritus is a fun video game. I recommend it, but that's not why I play it. When I play it, I get to think a bit about how lucky I am that I've had the good fortune to come across the things I enjoy, even when I don't remember how I did to begin with. It also inspires me to persevere with making my own creations, because who knows, someone out there I'll never interact with may give a toss about it even long after I stop giving one myself. Well, if there's one thing that you can't accuse me of, it's that I don't know how to run a professional looking operation. Speaking of being creative, this one's called The Last Person in the Country with a Checkbook. The year is 2049, and Daryl McPherson is the last person in the country with a checkbook. His bank, Nelson's, detested this. 
Nelson's had built its customer service reputation on decades of making things simpler for older customers. However, the times were changing, or rather, they had changed a long time ago. Their competitors had completely phased out checks, along with other offline systems years ago, and with the threat of a buyout by their largest rival, the Grantham Group, hanging over their heads, Nelsons were eager to cut every cost they could. Daryl McPherson presented a problem. Until he either stopped banking with them or died, Nelsons would have to continue wasting money on issuing checkbooks and maintaining systems for cashing them. This amount was likely a negligible waste, but Nelsons wasn't the type of bank that got where they were by considering any waste to be negligible. PR also didn't want the headache it would cause if a customer complained about checkbooks no longer being available. Something had to be done. First they thought, all right, we'll incentivize him to switch to online banking, or chip and pin at least, the dinosaur. No thanks, Daryl said. I'm no good with all that techie stuff, and I'm always losing things like cards. That's totally fine. We understand, Nelson said, livid with the searing fury of a business slighted. Have you considered switching to another bank that could offer you the exact same type of account and benefits that you already enjoy, but with better interest rates? No, that's all right, said Daryl. I've banked with Nelson's all my life just like my dad banked with Nelson's all his life, and like my dad's dad did too. Besides, it's too much for a faff, all the paperwork, you know how it is. Of course, who has the time? Agreed Nelson's, grinding their collective teeth to a fine powder. It wouldn't be the first time Nelson's had played the long game. We'll just wait for him to drop dead. He can't be that far off, he still uses checkbooks for God's sake. How old is he, anyway? They pulled up his details and, to their horror, discovered that Mr. McPherson was two months shy of celebrating his 34th birthday. Due to a curiously specific short-term memory problem, he was simply never able to remember his PIN number, and as such, preferred using checks instead. Finally, Nelson's decided to play hardball. They were going to resolve this McPherson situation permanently. The hitman they hired broke into Daryl's flat early one morning and held him at gunpoint in his own bedroom. A terrified Daryl threw his hands in the air and made no further sudden movements. Uh, uh, If it's money you want, uh, I'll I'll have to make a withdrawal from my bank in the morning, he yelped. Uh, I don't have a card for the cash machines. If it weren't for the balaclava, Daryl would have seen the hitman sneer as he said, that's exactly the problem. Had the hitman noticed the red laser dot that was trained on his brow just a moment sooner, he may have succeeded in dispatching Mr. McPherson. Instead, his head suddenly exploded like an overripe watermelon in a woodworking vice. A horrified Daryl couldn't bring himself to even twitch in fear as he heard someone scaling the wall outside his freshly shattered window. A similarly black-clad man climbed through its remnants and went about bagging the body. This goes deeper than you need ever worry about, Mr. McPherson. Unbeknownst to you, you are merely the smallest, yet most irritating thorn in the hide of a beast, too narrow-sighted to know it is already bleeding to death. To tell you more would be to put your life in further danger, but sleep well for the rest of your days, knowing that you, and dare I say your money, are protected by the right people. And with that the Grantham Group's director for mergers and acquisitions left through the same window he had shot through. Daryl's windows and room had been repaired and cleaned before he even had to leave for work. He believed his story about the break-in that had been interrupted by a murder would be too fantastic for anyone to believe, so he kept it between himself and the therapist that the Grantham Group had paid for on his behalf. And so, life went on much the same for Daryl. And he never even noticed that a few years later, the Grantham Group's logo began to turn up on the front page of his checkbooks. What is that? It's from Die Hard 3, and it's on whenever Jeremy Irons is in shot. What is that? I've been wondering this for years. What is that? 
I don't answer that question. Unfortunately, I can't command it. I do not know how to answer that. Two answers before you even get started. I don't know, and if I did, we wouldn't talk about it anyway. <laughs> but how can you have a debate if everything's secret? Alright, so I don't know how merit has entered my life, but I'm glad it did. On the other hand, I know exactly how I came across Zero Days. Zero Days is a 2016 documentary by Alex Gibney, probably best known for Enron, the smartest guys in the room. He's remarkably prolific, having turned out roughly a film or two every year since then. His films explore what often feel like heist-style conspiracies that the government, or private interests, have committed under the noses of the American public. For me, Zero Days just happened to be one entry in a long filmography that I was working through. Zero Days does its best to look into the development and impact of the 2010 Stuxnet computer virus, but no one is owning up, so we're all getting sent to bed with no dinner. Stuxnet may, or may not, have been the world's first usage of a cyber weapon developed by a nation-state to disrupt the critical infrastructure of another. It may, or may not, have been co-developed by the US and Israel with the intention of delaying Iran's nuclear program. One thing we do know is that Stuxnet was a worm capable of sending self-sabotaging instructions to several uranium-enriching centrifuges at a facility in Natanz. I'm being deliberately ambiguous here because the film itself is deliberately ambiguous, going to great pains to illustrate how difficult it is to get anyone with meaningful information to acknowledge Stuxnet's existence, let alone who was or wasn't involved in its creation or deployment. Look, for the longest time, I, I was in fear that I couldn't actually say the phrase computer network attack. This stuff is hideously overclassified, and it gets into the way of a, of a mature public discussion as to what it is we as a democracy want our nation to be doing up here in the cyber domain. Now, this is a former director of NSA and CIA saying this stuff is overclassified. As a real-world event, it's as fascinating as it is terrifying and powerful as a reminder of the real-world control that coders and hackers have over meat space. As a film, however, the content of Zero Days might have been better suited to a podcast. Out of necessity, it has to take lots of time explaining how and why Stuxnet is so damaging before it can get to the juicy conspiratorial stuff. As a result, it tries to supplement all the talking heads with matrix styly code flying around the screen. I guess all the really exciting footage of real-life coding being done is deeply classified. A sequence where threat analysts hook up a variant of Stuxnet to a logic controller so as to overinflate a balloon would come across as condescending were it not an actual, real-life thing they did to demonstrate Stuxnet's destructive capabilities. There's even this bizarre stand-in for NSA sources whose face is contorted with a wireframe mesh in time with her speaking as though having an ordinary actor just speaking normally wasn't doing enough for the whole cyber warfare theme. My point is, Zero Days is a bit heavy-handed in trying to provide some visual spectacle. When you're explaining the real-world capability to do substantial damage to a nuclear facility remotely, automatically, and irreversibly, any added theatricality is just going to stand out awkwardly. For my money, the most interesting question it raises is this. At exactly what point of a cyber weapons development does it become an act of war? Is it in devising a virus that disrupts another country's vital infrastructure? Is it the point where it starts getting coded? Or is it the order to deploy the weapon itself? There are decades of customary law in the physical world with which we can identify acts of war, but very little equivalent or precedent for hacking. Now that you have intelligence agencies hiring people to work out how to knock out entire power grids, you can't exactly put Pandora's genie back in the box. Bottle. Box. Now, a funny thing happened when I was in Blockbuster the other week. When I slid the required number of entertainment tokens under the bulletproof acrylic and asked to rent Zero Days, the dispenserman accidentally put the disc for Zero Day in the box instead, the 2002 Ben Coccio found footage film based on the Columbine shooting. A simple mistake on his part, certainly, but I hadn't realised until I opened the case at home, and I thought I'd give it a go anyway. 
There was no way I would have found Zero Day, were it not for the simple fact I was looking for something else that happened to share a very similar name. We must take these happy accidents for what they are, and embrace coming across them in the spirit of adventure. Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Home Gun Review. Well, today we're going to teach you how to make a big gun small and easier to conceal. Come on in. Zero Day is framed as though you are watching camcorder tapes left behind by its two main characters, Andre and Cal, made in the run-up to a mass shooting they commit at Iroquois High School. In saying even that much, I think you'll already have a strong idea of whether or not this film is something you want in your life, but if you're willing to stick around, I have a few thoughts to share. You recording? Yeah. The Army of Two has a myriad of supply depots all over the place. This one's in my closet. There is no Netflix documentary rubbernecking in either its tone or presentation. These are actors reading lines that have been written with clear authorial intent, but the skill of everyone involved to make the event seem as naturalistic as possible is really quite something to see in context. I've heard it said before that good editing practice is to make the editing seem as invisible as possible, and I think something similar could describe Cal and Andre's acting here. It is deceptively difficult to know exactly when to do things like rub your nose with your arm without drawing attention to it, or look at a lens directly, pretend to realise you are doing so, and look away again. Overdoing this sort of thing is really easy, and I think they deserve credit for the presence of mind it takes to make it look as seamless as they do, and this isn't even getting into the authenticity of the dynamic they create with one another. Narratively, Andre and Cal are completely convinced that they are different from all the other assholes who shoot up their schools, because they have a proper strategy, with a juvenile belief that what they're doing is the planning and discipline of a military operation. How could somebody just kill themselves? How many kids want to kill themselves and do? You know, thousands of kids do this. But how many of them realize that the way of the samurai is found in death? At the same time, they do things like make dick jokes with safe deposit boxes, egg houses, and wear Pearl Jam shirts. I mean, you have to assume they've heard the song Jeremy at least once. Besides getting called a name over a shirt one time, we don't see or hear about any specific incidents that drove them to commit mass murder, but their hatred of school and low opinion of society seem genuine, as do their unchecked senses of superiority that no one around them validates. One of the few moments of the film not directly filmed by either Cal or Andre is a sequence where Cal shares a limo with classmates on his way to a prom, while Andre has to work at his dad's pizza place. Without the power that comes of being the ones in control of the camera, they come across as fairly awkward teenagers, but hardly the recipients of such bullying or burdens that would remotely justify what they end up doing. And therein lies the film's power. It knows all the traps it could fall into, and doesn't. It's not nihilistic, it doesn't spend any time hand-wringing or finger-pointing, and it's unsympathetic with what little rationale Cal and Andre have fabricated for themselves. The film's skill is its subtlety in making Cal and Andre seem like people, and that's a fairly unique quality for a film based on a real-life mass shooting. Thank you for visiting us on this edition of Home Gun Show Review. For Andre and Cal, good night. Hey. Don't tell Dad, okay? It's one thing to think about the art you are lucky enough to stumble across over the course of your life. It's another to think about the stuff you were possibly never meant to see at all. This painting has come to be called Fight with Cudgels, but that's just a name that has become attached to it over time by historians. It has no official title, and it wasn't intended for public display. The 14, possibly 15, black paintings, as they've come to be known, were murals that Goya painted with oils directly onto the dry walls of his home in Madrid, sometime between 1819 and 1823, near the end of his life. At one time, these images would have surrounded Goya in both floors of his living space. Of all the black paintings, Time has seen Saturn devouring his son go down in history as the best known, 
being the most visceral and rooted in commonly known mythology. However, each of these feel like cathartic exercises by Goya, reflecting different facets about the state of humanity. There's something intangibly alluring about what sounds like forbidden art, creations that for some reason or another were damaged, private, or could have easily been completely lost. Really, each of the black paintings are rabbit holes worth disappearing down in their own right, but let's talk about a few interpretations of Fight with Cudgels in particular. Here's a silly game to play if you show someone this picture. Ask them, who do you think is winning this fight? Pause the video for a moment to ask yourself even, or a pet if they're available. Ready? Alright. Some people will favour this man on our right. Not only does he seem to have the heavier cudgel, but the man on the left is visibly bleeding quite a lot. They have both drawn back their weapons in preparation for another blow, so things are about to get a whole lot worse. Bob Ross over here on the left seems to have the right idea. He's going in for that big overhead smash, whereas Matt Damon on the right has somewhat poorly elected to block only his chin and jaw. This cudgel is being brought down with such force that it's rending the very clouds above them in twain. These are the original motion lines right here. Why suggest movement with cross-hatching when you can rip apart the very world around you? Brilliant. There's no real answer on who's winning this fight, of course, but it's a fun prompt to use with people as a way to start talking about motion or dynamics in still pictures. Now, taking a step back, looking at the whole, the focal point here, of course, is two guys having a fight, but the eye has to do some work to get there. Crucially, the fight itself isn't centred, and the two men, with their charcoal clothes and brown implements, are among the darkest things in the whole frame. The sky and land around them are comparatively bright, forming a large negative space that the eye can't easily ignore. Even if your eyes snap to the violence immediately, the environment envelops them. Just look at how little space these two fools take up in this whole thing. Not only are they surrounded by an uncaring landscape, but they're literally obscured by it. This mud or land they're standing on looks to be swallowing them. This could be partly down to the botched transfer and restoration job. In 1874, several decades after Goya's death, attempts of varying success were made to have the murals in his home transferred to canvas which are the coloured images we've been looking at. Some black and white photographs taken by Jean Laurent before the transfers took place do exist, where the figures can be clearly seen standing on solid grass instead of being swallowed by it. Nevertheless, seeing them admired in the land itself does feel appropriate, and is a good example of how preservation or degradation can inform interpretation long after the original is created. The natural universe will long outlive any of the petty squabbles of mankind, so perhaps it's possible to take an optimistic reading from all this, in a cosmic sense. I'm going to get into a reductively tiny bit of Goya's background here. I've waited until now because there's things we immediately notice upon first exposure to a still image, based on simply what is in front of us, that we may lose or adjust when we know more of the background. I like to talk about paintings more than painters, but they aren't made in a vacuum, and having the context after some time with the images alone is enriching. One interpretation is that fight with cudgels is an allegory for the futility of civil war. Goya saw an incredible amount of political upheaval in his life. If the height of his career was the 1790s, being prime court painter for the unpopular King Charles IV, then the Nadir may have been his failing health and self-imposed exile to Bordeaux in the 1820s, following Charles's abdication in the wake of a French invasion and the installation of Napoleon's brother Joseph. No matter what his station in life was, Goya was never far from seeing or feeling the impact of civil strife. Knowing this, two similarly dressed men, likely fellow countrymen, smacking the claret out of one another with sticks without a single person or animal around to see it go down, could be seen as deeply contemptuous. There isn't anything in the frame to indicate what they're fighting over. Even the painting itself, as a physical object, is in a state of relative neglect and disrepair. Countries do awful things to themselves and one another. 
we are capable of visiting great violence upon one another, and yet time will see the Earth subsume us all. Compared to the rich pastorals and tapestries of Goya's earlier work, it's safe to say that Cudgel's is, in a word, rough, and that's not all down to the bad transfer. It's not as overtly visceral or graphic as Saturn, but these heavy daubings of colour suggest that they were applied to the walls with some real force, perhaps out of anger, mockery, disgust, or some combination thereof. But why not? It wasn't made with a mass audience in mind. Creators of all kinds have always used their craft for private purposes. Even in the repainted and damaged state that we have them, access to the black paintings at all is a real privilege, one we were probably never intended to have. All in all, I don't think there's any way to look at fight with cudgels and come away thinking, oh boy, I sure do love being human, but it is certainly alive with the spark of creation. There are some things we're very lucky to be able to see, if we even should be seeing them in the first place. Dreadful news, gang. I've just run out of coffee, but bear with me, and we will survive the next few minutes together. This one's called Answers on a Postcard. Uh, this is the audience participation segment, where I would answer any questions or comments left on previous videos, but this being the first one, I don't have anything to respond to yet. So, I'm going to take this opportunity to answer some more localised queries from people in my day-to-day -day life. Let's see what we've got. This first one comes from my wife. Could you take out the garbage? I mean, there's nicer ways of asking me to take the dog for a walk, but certainly, sweetie, give me five minutes. This next one comes from Kyle from Georgia. What is your favourite song from London Calling? Well, Kyle, the flippant answer I recall giving you at the time was that I don't know or really like The Clash well enough to decisively say what the best song on London Calling is, but... Having gone away and thought about it a little more, I can definitely say, boys don't cry. Banger. This next one comes from the South Korean Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport. Specifically, their bank of driving test questions. I have no clue how this stuff gets in here sometimes. Which of the following is the correct action to take when the driver of a motor vehicle, excluding personal transport vehicles, like what? Segways? Uh, witnesses reckless driving action by another driver. A. Follow the reckless driver to give him her a warning. B. Block his her away and request an apology. Daring. C. Report the reckless driver to the police. Or D. Cause a traffic accident intentionally to stop his her driving. Hmm. Well, see. I've been driving for just over one year now myself, and that's long enough to know that the rules of the road operate on playground logic. So, going by that, I'm going to say that what you want to do is not C, that'd be the obvious choice, you want to do D, you want to cause the accident, because then when the police turn up, you can blame the other driver for having forced you to take such action. Uh, because the worst crime of all is uh, wasting police time. So, from me to you, top tip there. Uh, this one comes from Patrick, who's in middle school, second grade. Why was six scared of seven? Workplace politics, I imagine, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. This last one comes from my nan. Have you been eating properly? Well, Nana, by most metrics, I would say yes, but I'm still not sure on whether or not you've come around to pasta being a legitimate carbohydrate yet or not, so who's to say? Thanks, as always, for your concern. Love you. All right, that's it for this round's Answers on a Postcard. If you've got any thoughts or anything you want to share about anything I've talked about in this video, pop it down below or send a tweet email, singing telegram, what have you, um, and I'll get round to it next time. Enjoy your night, wherever you are, and I hope uh, it involves more coffee than I have, because this right here is pathetic. Now, on to whatever's next.
Let's wrap this up with something cheerful and a reiteration of why I bothered making this video. Sometimes, the things around you only take on artistic significance because of your circumstances at the time. I think a good example of this is found in a popular poem that I'm a big fan of called Having a Coke With You, written by New York poet Frank O'Hara in 1960. I liked it so much when I first read it that I reduced it down to like a 0.3 font and have been carrying it in my wallet for at least 10 years now. What an absolute sap I hear you bellowing at your screen. Those who know their poetry better than I do are probably saying, how trite, how obvious, that's like barely one rung up the ladder from getting the lyrics to Wonderwall tattooed on your arm. To that I say, shut up, I like it, it brings joy, and for what other reason should we ever do anything as humans? As to myself, I say, stop projecting and get on with it. At first, I liked the poem because I'd made some very close friends both online and offline around that time, and the hours we'd spend doing dumb stuff like watching bad movies or playing too much Micro Machines V4 while listening to Big Black meant so much more to me than the media we'd share to spend time together. Now, many years later, I can't see them as easily as I used to, but I still have access to the media that was of such importance to us. It's no replacement, but it still fills the heart, at least a little. The poem's called Having a Coke With You. Oh look, here's Frank O'Hara reading the poem himself. Handsome, isn't he? Getting to hear any poet deliver their own material themselves is a real treat, and fortunately for me, livens up what would otherwise be us just looking at an unmoving still of the text itself. This was back when spoken was still good for you, of course. Anyway, let's start from the title, because the poem is effectively a list of things that having a coke with you is better than. That turns out to be a lot of things, including some of the most significant works of art and some of the most beautiful places in the world. It's not the fact that it's a capital C Coke that makes the moment special. It's the simple act of taking in mundane experiences with someone you love, whoever they may be. In O'Hara's case, we know exactly who the you was at this moment. The poem was inspired by his longtime partner, Vincent Warren. It's clear that the places and art mentioned are of intense intimate significance. O'Hara had just come back from a trip from Spain and... Sorry, where did you go again, Frank? St. Sebastian, Irun, Ondai, Biarritz, Bayonne, or being sick to my stomach on the Travesera de Gracia in Barcelona. Right, thanks. Man, I wish I had your confidence to just pronounce names like that. Anyway, Spain is cool and all, but it doesn't compare to cracking open a cold one with Warren. O'Hara had a book called Lunch Poems, which was a volume slim enough to be carried in a pocket, and, I think is very telling of how poetry functioned for him, something to be picked up, used to help make sense of your life, then put down again so you can go ahead with the business of actually living your life. This poem isn't in that book, but I think the sentiment rings through all the same. Poetry works similarly to photography, in its capacity to capture part of a moment in time, but only parts of it. I sometimes think of poems like this as finely whittled journal entries. Here's where I was, what I was doing, how I felt. Of course, O'Hara's poetry sounds cooler. Words that roll off the tongue nicely, lots of enjambment. However, as he puts it, no matter how technically impressive the poem, painting, or whatever the art you're referring to may be, it's no substitute for recognising these feelings in real life, in real time. This is spelled out near the end. And what good does all the research of the Impressionists do them when they never got the right person to stand near the tree when the sun sank? He's not saying this makes art any less worth creating. Otherwise, why would he bother expressing even this much as a poem? No, the poem is a means to an end, a bit of stream of consciousness to try to bottle some of the essence of life. You can feel his urgency to get across his love of the moment. He doesn't have the time to pause, punctuate, or even care that he keeps repeating the same sentence structure. 
Does the spontaneity make this poem more emotionally authentic than, say, the artistic marvel that is Rembrandt's Polish writer, which gets mentioned as an example? Well, honestly, why bother comparing? It's a case of apples and oranges at best, and I'm not sure who it helps to say that authenticity is the be-all and end-all of a piece of art. I'm lucky enough to have certain people in my life I love having a coke with, so to speak, but in lieu of the times I can't be with them, countless artworks have shaped, enriched, and even saved my life, many of them a lot cruder and less impressive than the Polish rider. O'Hara's tongue is in danger of ripping clean through the cheek he has it in when he's being this flippant, but the poem is an affirming reminder that art resonates best when it conveys an experience of the heart. Craftsmanship or talent or skill be damned. Anyway, what I hope this little knee-jerk reaction while I'm LARPing as an armchair academic leaves you with is that if I was lucky enough to share something with you today that you found interesting, I wouldn't have done so had I not been compelled to by feelings of a similar energy that made O'Hara write his poem in the first place. Sometimes I do see, watch, play, make, read, or hear something, and I need to grab the nearest person to me who might even remotely care and tell them how I felt in the moment, because it mattered so much to me. Now, that's the stuff of life right there, I think. It's not going to go wasted on me, which is why I am telling you about it. My sincerest thanks for watching. The amateurish editing and production values belie the fact that I've been sitting on some of these segments for years, but it feels really good to be trying to get back on the horse and putting something out there into the world. I don't know when the next one will be. Several segments were cut because I deemed them even more irrelevant to the theme than the ones that actually made it in, if you can believe that. But they may resurface someday. Really, I just wanted to prove to myself I could even make something like this in the first place, so job done in a way. I'm off now to go pat myself on the back for a bit, then work out ways to make the next one less rough around the edges. In the meantime, I have a website, shrunkenshrine.com, where I'm currently chronologically exploring the roguelike deck building genre of games, so check that out if you like Slay the Spire, or that type of thing in general. I also have a Discord server, and can be found at most of the usual places with the handle at Shrunken Shrine. If you like, you're more than welcome to come say hello, but for now, I'm going to say good night.